So I just wanted to welcome everyone again to this special presentation hosted by Karen Zell of Homes and Lakeshore Keller Williams Realty Professionals based out of Fergus Falls. And I think we'll hear from Karen's husband, Tom. We're going to try and uh, rope him into the Q&A a little bit later. We're very excited that you're here. I'm Darla Palmer Ellingson, assisting with the presentation. And today's presentation is part of our our new educational series for those selling or buying a home. And, and Karen and Tom helped me buy my uh, home and, and sold my home in Battle Lake. Um, I doubt many clients asked more questions than I did. So uh, they, they have good practice there. Um, but I also wanted to introduce you to Karen Zell. Um, she grew up in Battle Lake. Um, on the lake and on the lake. She's, yes. yep, she's an expert in lakeshore properties and has really keen knowledge of Ottertail County uh, communities. So before coming a, becoming a licensed realtor in 2008, Karen owned and operated a popular lakes area restaurant for 14 years and working together with realtor husband, Tom Bearhouse under the brand Homes and Lakeshore, the team is consistently ranked as top selling agents for units sold in the six state North Central region. Um, Karen and Tom are part of Keller Williams Realty Professionals in Fergus Falls, where Tom is also a broker and both are very active in the community. And in my opinion, just some really nice folks. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, Karen, and okay. there you are. Now and this becomes my test. Yeah, now I'm going to turn it over <laughs> to you. So More you can share screen. You, you can tell we have some fun, right? <laughs> <laughs> it take, you know, I have to speak out loud. Share says, okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. So hi, everybody. Um, my name is Karen Zell. I know some of you, some of you may don't know me. Uh, those of you that do know that I speak fast. I do everything fast. And so if I speak too fast, let me know. I also like to have a little bit of fun. So um, hopefully we'll be able to do that as we go through this. Uh, really looking just to help educate people. Um, this business is, is great, but it's wild and kind of crazy. So how do we help you understand it better so that um, we can just educate people? That's my goal. So I'm gonna get going. Um, types of real estate markets. If anyone has listened to any bit of news uh, last uh, 12 months, we are definitely in a seller's market. And it just means a seller's market is when it's best for the sellers, obviously. Um, and it basically means that there is more demand than there is supply. So there's more people that want to buy than want to sell. Obviously a buyer's market's just turned around. Some of you probably remember 2005, six, seven, and I wasn't in the industry, but I listened to Tom a lot then. And I think things were going crazy at that time as well. My great, my grandmother said it will never last. And she was correct at 90, whatever she was. Um, in 2008, we had a crash, as people pretty much know, um, and it did become a very much a buyer's market in 8, 9, 10, even into 11. And then we kind of had a balanced market, 12, 13, 14, it was where three to six months supply, things were kind of mellow, things were kind of just happened. Um, and then, <laughs> I don't know, pandemic or we don't know, lack of building. Uh, a lot of builders got out of the industry when the crash happened because they lost things and it was very expensive. So we had a lack of inventory for a number of years. So that definitely um, influenced that. But pandemic or not, we don't know, but definitely seller's market right now. And those are my cute kids. I sold a place up by Baxter. So this is kind of a cool graph and, and it's crazy to think, you know, from 2012 all the way to 2021, if we look at Ottertail County, and this is February of last month, where we have come and where we're at. So it's crazy to look at 2012 and go up to 257. You go from 100, I mean, that's almost $100,000 in less than 10 years. 
So a lot of appreciation. What we did see in 2008, 9, 10, 11 is just the opposite. And it kind of bottomed and then it turned back up again. And 2012 is about where it started to go back up. It's kind of interesting that w how sharply it's going up uh, since we had the little flattening of the pandemic. And now that line's yep. going up even more yep. sharply. Last March, we found, you know, things halted. Everything was a halt because everyone didn't know what to do, didn't want to go anywhere, do anything. Um, and then we have been essential workers the whole time. So we got to keep working. We wore masks and sanitized and did many, many things, but we got to keep working. And so that line did go up again. And how far will it go? That's the question. And, and what we always say is we never know until it turns. And then we're already in the down before we know it. <laughs> um, so we just a house in Fergus Falls, Tom showed on Sunday, it had 21 showings in two days. So there are 20 some buyers that want to buy. Um, what determines your home value? Uh, it's like a ton of things. Uh, and I mean, when we look and say in Fergus Falls, okay, this house on this corner has a three bedroom, two bath and a double garage. And this house across town a little ways has three bedrooms, two baths and a double garage. We can kind of say comparables. What age, what condition are they in? Where's the, which part of town? Fergus has a pretty even keel that way. Um, who has granite countertops, who doesn't, uh, who's added the extra half bath in the lower level or whatever. Um, so we do look at comparable sales. That's what we have to do. Uh, but it's really dependent on a lot more than just a comparable sale. And right now the market conditions, the mar it's, it's a seller's market. So it's kind of crazy. We're also finding that a lot of people want to build but building costs are high. And so there again, they say, should I sell? Should I, what should I do? Where should I be? Obviously interest rates are huge. Interest rates have been the lowest they've ever, ever been um, in the history. I know when Tom was in like the 19 early eighties, they had like 16% interest. Can you imagine buying a home on your credit card basically? <laughs> I mean, because that's what people were doing. I, I can't imagine. I've never seen that. So even if we go back up to like 5%, which is still really great, people are going to kind of freak out because they're going to say, well, well, that's a high interest rate where it's really not. But there's just so many things that really go into your home value. Whoops. Hey, Karen, if I could yeah. interject, I, I did a, yeah. a comparison for uh, someone the other day. And a $900,000 property um, at 2% where we're at right now is the same as a 700,000 property at 4% where we were a couple of years ago. So even though prices have gone up, um, the, the buyers are still getting a good value because of that, that low cost to borrow. You're right, Darla. I mean, there's so much more home you can buy with that lower interest rate. So, wow, that's a, now 900 might be a little high for our area. Right. Um, just so you know. <laughs> Sorry, it was the only one I had the math done on. So there you go. It's very similar in any price range. That's true. <laughs> Um, also something just to realize when you're listing or, or buying or any kind of real estate deal, there are different types of agency relationship. And we are required to, to tell people uh, what the different uh, uh, representations are and explain that to them early in the relationship that we have. Um, we always have to treat people fairly, honestly, ethically, and make sure if there's something that we know about a home that is going to seriously affect their enjoyment, we have to make sure we, we tell them that. Um, I had to also tell, we have to listen to our sellers. If our seller says this or this or this, that's what we have to do. They're our boss. Now, I always add the thing in there that we have to do anything that's lawful. 
we cannot be out doing things that aren't uh, within the law. So don't just say, oh yeah, you're my, I'm, I'm your seller. I can do, you can do whatever. No, um, but we do, that's the people, that's who employs us. Um, when we take a listing, um, the seller is our boss and we don't say to someone else, oh, I think they'll do this or I don't think they'll do that. It's totally up to the sellers as to what they're going to do. Uh, we do have people that come to us and say, hey, Karen, I want you and only you to represent me as a buyer. So just like if we list someone's home, we can list someone's body basically with us and say, we have a buyer's contract. So now you get to work with me and me only. And if you really get sick of me, we can break up, but we hope we don't. Um, anytime that we have a, a listing with someone or representing them or anyone in our company, and this is with any company, um, and if we have a buyer's contract as well, we then become what's called a dual agent where we're representing both, not to the detriment of either. And we basically become neutral as far as price terms and motivation go. So I can't say, well, I think they'll do this. I think they'll, I think you should offer. I think, so we just have to stay neutral. It basically keeps me, it, like I always tell everybody, it keeps me from talking, which is hard. So um, it keeps me from talking. Um, and that's how we treat people fairly in those instances. And then a facilitator is a is basically, um, I just did one. Uh, we had someone that had their own buyer and they came to us and said, will you please do our paperwork for us? And we did that and we do it for an, uh, a basically a nominal fee and help them get through all the transaction correctly and legally. So those are the different types of agency in Minnesota, might be different in other states. And I should say too, once you have a, a a, a license in the state of Minnesota, I can sell a home anywhere in the state. Uh, do I? No, not usually because of travel for one thing. And I also don't feel that I'm an expert in like Minneapolis. I wouldn't, I don't know anything about the Minneapolis market. I don't know Rochester. I don't know. So we have a referral system that we work with and, and that really helps a lot. We can refer someone to someone we may know or connect with someone so that if someone's moving, let's say they just sold their lake home and they're moving to Minneapolis, I can help because I know some people in Minneapolis that will help them and I feel good about that. So that's kind of a cool thing. A CMA or comparative market analysis is what we do when we get ready to list a home. And the main things we look at, what have other similar homes sold for in the past six months or less? And then we adjust for bedrooms, bathrooms, lakeshore. Um, like I said, two houses in town that are similar are pretty easy. Lakeshore is difficult because first you have the lake and we have a thousand lakes in Ottertail County and each one is different. And then we have the lot and then we have the, are we on a level lot? Are we on a cliff? Are we, where are we? So they become a little trickier. So what we'll do is go to the similar, that lake to start, and then we'll go to similar lakes. So I compare West Battle and Otter Tail and Pickerel together. Um, next is like East Lost, Deer Lake, um, East Battle. They kind of connect. So that's how we do that. Um, as far as towns, we kind of go with what town, um, you know, what's in Fergus Falls, what's in Battle Lake, Underwood. Um, and that's really important. If I just can't say the to, when you when you're choosing an agent, first you should look at their reputation and then look at how they present themselves when they come. If they come with nothing and just say, what do you want to list your house for? Uh, not quite what you want to do. Um, we really work hard at this to, to do the best for our clients. So, um, and then you have to like them and trust them. Uh, that's a huge part. Uh, Tom has done this for 44 years. I think he says 45 now, but, um, he hasn't been doing it just because he isn't trustworthy and likable. He knows what he's doing and treats people fair and they always come back to him. Uh, then we get listing decisions. Okay, we have to determine list price, optimum closing date. Um, 
financing you will accept. This gets into a little more detail about cash. We always take cash. <laughs> uh, cash is, <laughs> we love cash. Um, cash is quicker to close, no appraisal usually. And um, it, it just, we like cash. Hey, Conventional we, client, Karen, we had, a, we had a question come in yeah. um, previous that if, if somebody is offering cash, does that, um, sway their offer over another offer? Um, many times it does, even if it is a lower offer. Um, it's, and and that will be our next seminar in May, talking more about how we do things once we have a house listed. But I'll give you a little insight there. Um, because a cash offer usually does not require an appraisal. And so we don't have to worry about the bank saying, yes, you're going to get your money. They mm -hmm. have cash. Mm -hmm. So it is a stronger offer, mm -hmm. just like conventional financing, which means they have anywhere from three to 20% cash down mm -hmm. is probably more attractive than FHA, v VA, or rural development. Mm -hmm. Those are all great. They're great programs. We love them. We use them a lot, um, but they're very low down payment mm -hmm. and they're harder to, it's government programs. Sure. So VHA, FAHA, and uh, VA and rural development are all government programs. So they're pickier when they come to the appraisal because if you were buying a property with nothing down or, you know, because VA and rural development are basically zero down, um, FHA is three and a half percent cash. If you had someone coming to you buying a house and say, hey, will you give me money? And it had bad shingles. Uh, siding was peeling and the railings were all, you know, or a bunch of mess, um, you would probably say, mm, I don't know if I want to uh, give you the money. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is uh, trickier appraisals. Like I said, we use it. We use it a lot. And we love to use VA because obviously for our vets, we love to that they have that option for zero down financing. Mm -hmm. Then we're also seeing contract for deed is something that's that is always available. It's just, if you still owe money on your home, you may not be able to do a contract because you will have to pay a lot of, a lot of financing is due on sale. So if you sell your home and you owe hundred thousand dollars, you have to pay that off. Um, but if you don't, and if you owe it free and clear and you say, I don't need all that money right now, perhaps I can charge a little higher interest rate I can charge 6% to someone, get some money down. And then if they don't perform, I can take my house back. Mm -hmm. So basically a contract for deed, the owner of the home is the bank, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So yes, cash is always going to be a little stronger, no, no matter what. Another thing, and we'll, we'll talk about this and we, we learn this as we go, but you can write if an, an offer that is contingent on, or, or you are getting financing, but it's not contingent on that. You know you can get the loan. The bank has said, you're good, you're no problem, go. That will then kind of transfer and look like basically a cash transaction because you know you can get the financing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we use that sometimes to make a stronger offer, even if you are financing. Hmm. Okay. Oh, this one is fun. I don't know if you want me <laughs> to do it. Maybe me on a, a, a ladder is not a good plan because I seem <laughs> to fall often, but um, that is me on our, la on our ladder. Um, and we get into now um, home repair, staging, or inspections. Darla put this picture in, by the way, I did not. Um, <laughs> I, I creep on Karen's Facebook and I steal <laughs> pictures of her all the time. That was my uh, birthday present a couple of years ago was that nail gun. Best thing ever. Um, so basically with home repairs, uh, safety hazards are all, almost always going to come up as an issue if uh, they have a home inspection. So that would be um, railings not secure, uh, a lot of... Uh, rot or 
a window might fall out or there's no deck on where a sliding glass door is. Um, so safety hazards are always important. Um, updates, I'll talk about that as kind of we're gonna go through here there and cleanliness, absolutely most important. So Karen, so, I, I yeah. had mentioned to you before that we, uh, we took some questions from people that wanted a recording after the fact. And, mm -hmm. and someone had asked, do you ever advise on uh, repairs or remodeling projects that sellers should not do? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, when I'm staging and, and I have I've taken classes on staging and I just kind of like to do it and have worked at it for the last, I started doing it before I get, became a real estate agent for Tom uh, because it just, my eye kind of does that. Uh, and there are some things that people will say, oh my gosh, we need to do this and this and this and this. And we look at them like, oh no, no, don't. Um, so really it depends on what it is and how much money and will they get the return. Um, you know, putting granite countertops in your kitchen next week will probably not get you that return. So, you know, just certain, it, it's totally dependent on the property, the market, and where we need to go with that. We just had a home, the carpet was in pretty, it was pretty dirty and we had it cleaned and really it, it came to the point where it didn't need to be replaced because again, and a lot of people say that, well, if I put in, you know, purple carpet, oh, duh, they're not going to want that. But um, so it, it just really depends. I like to do staging is more to me about clearing things and cleaning things. And your home can look so much better just with those two things done. You don't have to spend millions of dollars. Um, this is a very nice home that we sold. This is Darla's Thank house, you. I think, isn't it? Yes, and, and uh, you guys advised me to get smaller uh, living room furniture. We had a very well-loved big dog couch. So thank you for that. Yes, and you. the fun part is when people do what you say and they see the difference and they, they get it because that really makes a difference. Um, so first you have to realize there's things you can't change. You're not going to add a second story, um, you know, uh, move your house, change the neighborhood. I mean, it just, you can't change those things. So move on from that. But there are so many things you can change. And again, not for that much money. Um, the first thing you have to do is kind of disconnect. Um, I don't care if someone has purple and pink and green. I, who cares if you live in your house and you love it? I'm happy for people. I had those colors in my house, um, very beachy pink and yellow and orange. And it was kind of crazy, but it was fun. And I loved it. Before we, we sold our house, I painted um, to disconnect and to, to get that uh, a little more down to neutral. Uh, so emotions, personal items, and buyers want to see a blank slate. And we just went to a lake cabin the other day, and it, there are a couple cool antiques in the, in the property. And we said, make sure you take those before we list, because someone that comes in will see that and go, that's really cool, and I want that. And it can, personal property can really wreck things. So anything you absolutely have to have, grandma's rocker or great uncle's painting or whatever it is, remove it. Um, first impression, curb appeal, siding, shingles, windows, driveways, um, just, I mean, this is beautiful. And I like to use this next picture because I think some people think, oh man, I have to have a $400,000 home to make it look really great. And, you know, I, I, my house just isn't that nice, so I can't make it look good. Well, if you look at this, it's a small little home with lots of stuff. And even though this next slide is not the same house, it's so similar and it's such a difference in that they just put some shutters on, got rid of stuff and put a couple little plants out. You do not have to have a million dollar home to make it look good. And I know nobody here probably has too much stuff. I, I know, <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, I, I don't, well, I even do now somewhat again. We always do. 
And that's the biggest thing when I walk into house and believe me, I've walked into some and I'm like, they'll never get out of here ever. And they seem to, but um, too much stuff is always the biggest problem. I would say that's number one. Think positive, you're moving. So start packing. I do the three, um, the keep, the trash and the donate. Thrift stores take stuff, go for it. Um, the Boys and Girls Club up in Detroit Lakes, I have a, a client that's getting ready to list their home and they've been like there with trailer loads. So there's places to take it or there is a dump. Lots of garage sales. That's, a, <laughs> uh, that's not, uh, <laughs> that anyone else can do that. But uh, um, <laughs> so really we go through and we say, okay, the inside, the kitchen, bathroom, super important. Um, here again and we all have it I mean you look at my refrigerator right now it has a bunch of stuff stacked stuck on it because that's how we live but when we get ready and I explain so much is that it has to look best when the professional photographer comes in and we only use a professional photographer I used to take our pictures and I was okay at it no not anymore not in today's world got to have a professional photographer and we have one that does drone so for country and lakes, we always use drone photos as well. And that's so important um, because every day your house is having an open house because it's online. So if it, and oh, Tom will laugh at me, I'll be looking at the sheet in the morning where new listings come on and he'll be like, I'll be like, oh my gosh, look at that picture. And he'll be like, oh man, shush. But you know, toilet seats, uh, beds unmade. I'm like, just drives me crazy. Um, leave only necessary appliances, get rid of stuff. Um, you know, appliances, it can depend. Um, it depends on your pricing of your home, depends on do they work or not. If you have a stove that only one burner works, well, yeah, you might want to replace it. Um, if, you know, it, it just kind of depends. And again, that's where someone with some knowledge can give you that. Um, I replaced hardware on cabinets and that has made a huge difference too. Although the brass is going to come back again, I think. Um, see this kitchen a little messy. This one, lots of stuff. Clean as a whistle. It just makes you feel like ah, fresh. This one I was, well, it has a more, it has a few things, but it's not overkill. And then this one as well, just a few things just makes it just kind of, and that's a very small kitchen, but it makes it appear pretty large and, and nice, nice, and it's just clean. Bathrooms. And those of you that know me, I used to own a restaurant and uh, the bathrooms were super important to me and they still are. And I, I, I just have that deal when I go into a restaurant that, I look at the restrooms and it just kind of bugs me when they're not very clean because then I worry about the rest of the place. So same with your house. So important to have them clean. Um, again, faucets, hardware, do, do they work? You know, if you have a, a faucet that's falling to pieces, they're not that expensive to replace. Um, I also tell people to use showing towels, which sounds kind of silly, but if you have three kids at home and they all you do this in the morning and then you're like, what do I do? Okay, take all those towels, put them in the hamper or the laundry or something and put out nice clean towels and then leave. Don't go home <laughs> till the showing's over. See this one again, you know, and it's not a bad bathroom. I think if we had it cleaned up a little, it would not be bad. It's just so much different with clean bedrooms and I've never had to move with when I've had any kids at home so I can't imagine keeping houses clean when you have like a six a two and a three-year-old or whatever try to keep things organized I can't imagine um, so we really tell people to you know go start going through kids toys and clothes and get down to one tote so you can throw it all in a tote and put it in the closet if they're going to have a showing um bedding, furniture, closets are always my last concern because closets are supposed to have stuff in them. Garages are supposed to have cars and some things in them. But, you know, 
the rest of the house shouldn't have um, your laundry stacked around. Um, again, bedroom with just a lot of stuff. This one just cracks me up because I don't know what this is. Is it a bedroom? Is it the office? Is it a reclining room? Is I think that's a crib. Um, so really way too much stuff. Oop. And this one's just neat, clean, easy. Living spaces, this one, and especially this last year, I'm sitting at our dining room table, of course, because who hasn't been this last year? Because you're working, <laughs> right? Um, and that's great for when you're working, but if you're going to have the pictures taken, make sure you make it look like a, a eating space instead of um, the office. Um, so is it being used for its intended purposes? And the furniture, there, there's most people have too much and it's too big, and that's great when you live there. But when you're getting ready to make it look really positive and clean and clear and open, it helps. I just told one lady, I said, when you get to the point where you think it looks bare, you're, you're perfect. Or maybe <laughs> remove, maybe remove just a couple more things. And she's like, okay. And she did. So it was awesome. Um, highlight the positives. You know, a lot of people have beautiful windows and they have this, like these draperies and stuff over them and get rid of that. Um, make sure your fireplace, most people, that's a cool spot in your house. So make sure it's, it's the highlight. Um, hardwood floors are really pretty. Make sure they're showing. And um, my mother-in-law bought a home and uh, she had carpet in her living room and I start pulling on the edge. This was about five years ago. And pretty soon I had the whole living room carpet pulled up. She had this beautiful hardwood floor underneath and um, she now still has a beautiful hardwood floor. Hey, um, Karen, Susan asks, how important is it to stage if the home has been empty? You know, that's, that's a tricky one um, because I, I'd much rather see it empty than too full. Uh, but if you have things that you could put in and say, you know, I don't think bedrooms because you kind of know where a bed's going to fit. But if you had some furniture to put in and make it kind of look like it's supposed to be how it is. I think it's good. I wouldn't go spend money or go buy things or any of that kind of thing. Um, because less is always better. Does that make sense, Sue? Yeah. Yeah, there was a, a follow up question we had gotten earlier. So is there a strategy to get rid of everything that you know that you're going to want to take to the new house and maybe leave, you know, a few pieces of furniture behind or is there some kind of strategy there well, for staging? It depends, it depends kind of on where you're at because if you haven't moved yet, I mean, right. um, you know, you know things and we don't have a big struggle like in, in like in Fergus or town homes, not town homes, but town houses in town. Is that what I want to say? Because people know that you're probably taking those things with. So furniture doesn't become as much of an issue in homes. Yet, if you have a bunch of things and it's just too much, then you wanna downsize it. Um, and I go and do this, I mean, that's part of our listing. I don't charge for it, I don't do it. I just go and help people get ready because it's only in our advantage that people sell their homes and we want it to look the best. Mm -hmm. So um, so yeah, I mean, but you know, just, more or less is more, but I don't think you have to worry so much of taking everything out that you want in the next home if it makes it look too bare for you. You and Tom still have that moving trailer that you loan out? We sure do. Okay, that was very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> it's got our faces plastered all over it, okay. and um, yes, it is. It's a very, it's a nice covered and closed trailer, so it's really nice on like a day like today, maybe. Um, so yes, we do use that. Thanks, Starla. <laughs> awesome. Here again, lots of stuff. And then very much cleaner. And this was a littler home too. Um, I try to highlight the smaller homes just because I think that's real. <laughs> and so just to make it fresh and clean, you can just see it's clean. 
And then ceiling. So the fun one I like is that people may have a stain or a crack on their ceiling and they've fixed the issue. So maybe they put new shingles, they fixed whatever it was, but they never fixed the inside. Make sure you fix the problem on the roof, but then make sure you fix the inside. And of course you'll disclose this on your disclosures. Hey, we had a leak, we fixed the roof and now the ceiling, but otherwise someone walks in and I don't care what you tell them, they think that you have a leaky roof. <laughs> because it looks like it. <laughs> and then paint is my friend. Um, I love to paint, so I'm a very unusual person, but um, it is one of the cheapest, easiest ways you can really make a fresh look. Um, and if you don't know how to do it, get someone that can. Uh, but it really is one of the, the best, freshest. Even if you do the same color, just a new coat, it's amazing the difference it makes. And we're going through stages. Brown was the big thing like, what, 15, 20 years ago. And now we're into the grays. Next, we're going toward white, white and black. And I'm not really white. I mean, I don't like, it's too cold for me, but I'm working on it. And then windows. Um, this is something too. And, and while we were in the pandemic, when we were first doing it, we told everyone, leave your lights on when you do your showing. Open the window shades so people don't have to touch things. Um, and you know, if your windows are foggy and yucky and don't open, I mean, that's something that you probably should fix. I also take a lot of screens off my windows and that sounds weird, but I don't like looking through screens and we don't, you, you just have a better view and look when you don't have screens on every window. Uh, and in fact, in my we don't have many screens on our house and we don't have many windows that open because most people don't open every window in their house. You usually have air conditioning or just need a cross breeze. Um, but windows are again, as they're getting older, maybe you can just you know, sand them down, put a new coat of poly on them, just make them, give them, give them some more life. <laughs> And then walls, cracks, nail holes. It is really hard when you take all your pictures down. Sometimes it looks worse. So I tell it's fine to have a picture of a pretty scenery picture or something. You just don't want uh, a picture of your grandchild since day one, 12, 15, you know, every picture the kids ever had on your wall. Um, Wallpaper is coming back a little. Um, not borders, but wallpaper, they're seeming to do it just on like one wall or something, um, which I'm kind of okay with. Uh, it just kind of depends on the home. The old borders that go around every room and every bedroom, they, they got to go. They've got to go. I don't see that as much as we used to. I think people kind of got that gist. Mm -hmm. hey, Karen, I don't know if you're going to cover this, but... Um... You had suggested, we didn't need to repaint our, our home, um, but we redid our doors. And I think we did around the windows too and the garage door. So, you know, is that for a pop of color or um, what's the there strategy? Is, well, it kind of depends on what it looks like as the overall. When you're looking at it and you say, you know, that should stand out or it shouldn't stand out. Um, there's some things that should stand out and then some things that really shouldn't. Um, and so again, to look at the whole picture is super important. I don't know if that really answered that, Darla. Yeah, I think ours were peeling too. So it oh, might've been a maintenance yep. issue. Yeah, and anytime people want to go in and people don't wanna do work. Um, I bought a half burned down house uh, about 30, you know, not 25 years ago. So to me, it's kind of like, I like that, but I'm not quite normal. What'd you say? Uh, <laughs> so most people want to go in and they just want to say, okay, I might paint and I might do this, but I don't want to scrape the windows and I don't want to repaint the front door. And I don't want to do this mm -hmm. because it's hard. It's a lot of work. And if you don't have the time and the energy or the knowledge, it's it's no fun to look at that and say, oh, look what we have to do here before we can move in. Ugh. Mm -hmm. um, 
flooring again is, is super important. Like I said, when I pulled up that carpet at my mother-in-law's, it was like, they've been hiding this beautiful hardwood and hardwoods are in. I mean, most actually solid surface floors are in. Carpet has kind of seen, um, you know, it's, it's here and there. Bedrooms are still great. Uh, most living spaces don't have carpet anymore. Um, crack tile, um, you know, just make sure it looks good. Oh, and here's our best friends. None of us have dogs that are all over the place, do we? Uh-uh, no. <laughs> um, the biggest one now, and I think we've come a long way in smoking because not as many people smoke anymore, but we've gone to homes and you have to tell people not to smoke because it's icky and other people don't want smoke and it's very hard to get rid of. Um, and then pets and musty smelling a lot of times in basements. So make sure a dehumidifier is running, something like that. And Darla tells me, I've had this on here. She says there really is an air freshening paint additive. Yeah, there is. I've never used it. Yeah, it, it really helps when we uh, redid a, well, a barn, basically turned it into a shouse and had some recycled cabinets, got it at Home Depot. You just add it to your paint. And it's, and it's very strong scented, but then, you know, after and a while, mellows. Yep. It, it, it mellows and it's non-toxic, so it doesn't affect your food. Nice. Nice. And yeah, that's what's showing too. You have to control your pets or take them with you or something. So um, I just have a few photos that, and, and I'm, I'm, this is an actual listing on the left. Um, and they called us and their house didn't sell and said, would you come and help us? Tom went first and he came home and said, oh my, we've got a job to do, or you've got a job to do. <laughs> so he sent me out and she was the most lovely person and no one had ever told her that she shouldn't have all that stuff. And I felt bad for her because I was like, no one told her and she loved her green walls. And I'm like, I, I'm happy you like your green walls and I'm glad you like all this stuff, but no one else is going to like, and we want to show, and she did everything. She started packing like crazy. Um, she had the ceiling painted, the walls painted. It just made such a huge difference. And I have a couple more to just kind of show the difference. And I mean, this is extreme. I don't see this too often, but it really, I mean, it's huge. Even the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So the listing goes live after the staging is complete, the professional photos are taken. We then put it on the multiple listing service. It goes to about 300 and some other sites, signs put up, lockbox put on. Um, we just had a property in Fergus Falls that we went there about a month or so ago and they had so much stuff. And it just got listed this last week and they had it, they did again, everything we asked them to and it sold for a little over asking price mm -hmm. in two days. And, and things aren't staying on the market long, like you said, two, two days. Yeah. Is, if any, if, if the time, the time to sell is now, the right. trick is where do I go? I don't know. We just had someone that listed, they, they're going to build in about a year, maybe a year and a half. And they said, we know we need to sell now. We'll go rent something for a, a year. We're, we're okay with that. We know we're going to get our best price. So that's well, kind of crazy. Um, that might be, oh, that might be the end. <laughs> what did I do? Wow. <laughs> See, I'm a fast talker. I'm a fast talker. Yeah. But I think we do have Mr. Verhelst just walked in the door. So I have one question for Mr. Verhelst. If he will come over here and I'll ask him the question. I, I heard See. him in the background. I think he was making lunch. He's making a fire, actually. <laughs> we have a fire going. <laughs> so the question I have for Mr. Verhelst. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Why have you done this so long? Um, I guess I didn't know what else to do, number one. But no, I started when I was 19. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful career. The first five to 10 years were a struggle because interest rates were 12 to 
and I knew no one in the community that uh, I moved into. So uh, it takes getting to know people and, uh, and, and then treating them honestly and fairly and uh, answering their questions instead of telling them what, what they should hear. Um, it's just, it's been a, a rewarding career. It's about working with people and dealing with people and seeing the smiles on their face when they close on a home. Mm-hmm. whether it's the first one or we've got one client that uh, has been with me since 1985 and it's every two years. So we're pretty excited about that client that they call every two years and say, okay, we're ready to list our home. It shows well and it sells quickly and then they move on to the next one. But uh, I get a lot of satisfaction out of working with first time home buyers because I get to educate them. So Overall, it's been a great career and uh, I've enjoyed it. So Tom, did I ask the most questions of any client you've ever had? You were a challenge. (laughs) Yes, she was. was Does anyone else have any questions for Karen or Tom? Anything about staging or anything at all? You can, oh, I can turn on everyone's mic too. Sorry about that, you guys. I'm, I'm controlling everybody's microphone. <laughs> so, let's see. Oh, I guess some of, you guys can probably unmute your own self. Let's see if I can unmute you over here. So the real estate industry is an interesting one that, um, that, Uh, People, everybody loves real estate. Everybody likes to talk about real estate and it's, it's, it's interesting. It changes all the time. And, and we've had some really good times the last 10 years. The values have been appreciating nicely. The market is active. Um, In my 44, 45 years, this is the most unusual market that, that I've experienced in that there is truly a lack of inventory. And it's attributed to a number of things. There's uh, the, the extreme low interest rates has, has fueled the buying activity, high building costs, uh, that the crash of seven, eight, nine, ten, put a halt to building. So we lost probably four years of inventory that should have been, that normally would be built, that would now uh, be a 10, 12 year old home that's not going to come on the market because it was never built. And so it's, and the building costs today have, have increased substantially. So it's, it becomes a, an affordability issue for people to be able to afford to build, which creates uh, a more of a pressure on the existing inventory that we have. Hmm. So, and then, and then the, the low interest rates are, they're awesome, but they're also a demon in that if you refinance at 2% and the rates go to 4%, which is ex- still extremely low, it's hard to give up your 2% because you don't want to pay 4%. Right. And so Starlet has an example of that. So, right. Yeah. So, so it's an in- interesting time. We've got uh, some inter- interesting times ahead in my opinion. And, and, uh, it, but it's been a great career and it's, it's a great business to be in. So Tom, if, if someone was going to make a change to their home to get ready to sell, you know, what, what do you think are the top physical changes to make? Well, I, I think Karen covered a lot of that. It's, it's, it's truly staging and mm-hmm. truly getting rid of, of things or, or packing things up that you're going to keep that are going to move on to the next property. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, this most recent property, it was an estate. And it was two sisters that uh, had to deal with, uh, with their brother's home and that they have not been to for a period of time. And it was truly very full of, of really, really full and, and hadn't, and, and he, he had some health issues and he just wasn't able to take care of it mm-hmm. on the inside. So it was extremely dirty and, uh, it looked like the carpets were not salvageable, but once we got a carpet cleaner in there and cleaned them up, they ended up to be 
pretty decent a- after all. And, and it was just really working hard to get things out of the home and making it look good. And obviously we were at one on a lake this Saturday and uh, there they've got some rotted window sills. Uh, the door handles aren't on the, on the doors. Uh, there's some moss growing on the shingles. So it was, it was obviously suggesting to them that if you don't address the, these issues, it, it is going to affect you negatively in price. Mm-hmm. And more so than what it would cost to address the issues. Sure. Because pe- people always perceive the project to be more expensive and possibly bigger than what it maybe really is. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I just wanted to remind folks, you can unmute yourself if you want to talk and ask a question. Um, Tom and Karen, I, I wanted to ask you a question from the, the buyer's perspective. You know, I, I know you guys follow the market quite closely and, um, you know, the, the pandemic was not a, a crisis that was started from the financial industry like our past economic downturns have been. So are you seeing confidence in, in buyers? Are there buyers out there um, ready, ready to buy? Um, you know, what, what's the situation with that? Well, yeah, it, the market is extremely strong. They're, the last 10 homes that I've tracked have come on and sold for anywhere from five to 25,000 above asking. And that's happening within two to four days. Wow. So, so the market is extremely strong and it's, it's, it's that way across the country. It's not just mm-hmm. Fergus Falls or right now out there. I don't believe there's a home for sale in Battle Lake, Underwood, Fergus Falls has 12 to 14 homes to choose from. Uh, Ottertail County, a thousand lakes in the county. We have maybe 40 lake homes available. So it, it, the pandemic has actually helped the real estate market. People want a home versus an apartment they, because they're working from home. And so they, they want to be able to have a, a nicer environment to work within per se. Okay. Um, Susan is asking a question and um, you might need to answer this by email as well, but um, she wants to ask about a situation where how is the cost basis determined on a property that's deeded to a family member, not inherited when they pass? Does an attorney or tax accountant or state agency get involved? Um, do Do you know how that valuation is determined? Well, the, a good a good starting point would be the assessed value. Mm-hmm. And, and then secondly, it would be having a realtor or an appraiser take a look at the property and go out and tell them what, where it's at at this time. Mm-hmm. So. Sure. Yeah, you're... Um, we're really lucky in Ottertail County that the appraisals do go closer to value than many, many other markets that I've seen. So the state of Minnesota uh, has a mandate to all counties that the assessed value has to be no less than 90% mm-hmm. no, and no more than 105% uh, on an average in the county on a given year. So every year the assessor takes all sales into consideration and, and then makes determinations on what they're gonna assess in the future. And if, if there's an area that, that there were 10 sales that were all less than 90%, they are going to be state mandated to raise them. Mm-hmm. And obviously where an assessor can be off is that a lot of people do projects and remodeling and don't call the assessor and let them know that they put in granite countertops or that they put in a walk-in tiled walk-in shower so where you'll see the assessor not being within that 90 to 105 is where major projects have been done and then where they're not going to necessarily be within the 90 to 105 is when we're in a market like we are right now where properties are being priced at at top of the 
top of the market value. And then the market is saying, we'll pay you more than that. Right. So, so 2022 assessed values will certainly see an increase based upon 2021 sales. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that they're busy in that office as well. Um, <laughs> in, any, <laughs> any final comments you or Karen want to add or anyone want to chime in with a final question for Tom or Karen? We've also just, got the, the email up on the screen too, if you want to email later. Just a quick question with my last question I had. I guess my question is, who determines a capital gains um, tax? How does that get determined if you have a home that um, you sell and you need to pay that? I mean, where, where does that amount get determined? Is that a state, federal? Well, capital gains, capital gains tax is determined upon um, the value. So in most cases, when they determine capital gain, it's based upon what you paid for it, the improvements that you made to it, the, your selling expenses. You add all those together and, and subtract it from the sale price. So with an estate, you, you, you have to establish a value at the time of death. And then, then it would be, a, if there is a capital gain, it's, is it selling for more than that established value at the time of death? minus whatever selling expenses might be there. But when it comes to what your actual gain is and what your tax is, we are not accountants. We're, that is an accountant question that will determine what the gain actually is and what your tax may be. Um, and there's a lot of talk right now about uh, Mr. Biden's desire is to raise that capital gains tax. Uh, so, it, and I'm not sure if that if that becomes retroactive or not. So there again, it's questions for the accountant. If what what is being proposed, and how will that affect me? So, the the yeah. one thing the one thing that I learned early on in my career was that if I don't know an answer to a question, I'm going to tell people I don't know. I'm either going to try get the answer or I'm going to refer you to somebody that can provide you the answer that you're looking for. So. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Any other questions? Well, thank you guys so much. Karen, you did an awesome job. Tom, thank you for chiming in. We, you know, we heard you in the background, so we knew you were there. <laughs> Banging around, I'm like, shush. <laughs> and thank you again, everyone, for joining us. I wanted to remind you that Karen's top 10 home staging tips uh, will be in your inbox tomorrow, along with Karen and Tom's personal contact list of uh, contractors and other vendors that sellers often need when they're preparing to sell. Uh, and we're going to be continuing this series next month with all of the details sellers should consider once your home is actively listed for sale. So in the meantime, if you have any questions, please reach out at info at homesandlakeshore.com or via our website, homesandlakeshore.com. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thanks.